Let's talk a little bit about, you know, something that's in the news a lot and uh, people talk about it a lot. And, you know, there's the two approaches to it. One is people who kind of say, well, some of this is true and others who dismiss this out of hand. And that that's the, the conspiracy theories. I think Alex Jones is probably the most famous just because he's in the news so much. But really, conspiracy theories are everywhere. But, you know, you, you've got the uh, the Soros conspiracy theory. He he basically runs the world. He's the he's the vil, the devil from the left. You've got the Koch brothers, who are conspirators of the right, and uh, and and then you've got you know all the way to the elders of Zion. And uh, I still hear the Bildenbergs. I thought the Bildenbergs were passe, but I still hear the Bildenbergs and the Rothschilds and. Um, running the world. So uh, don't forget about the lizard people. Yeah, I never knew if that how serious to take that one. The other ones, I think they, they're serious about them. But I don't know. I mean, who knows? Because there's one about the Queen of England, too. I yeah, think there's, 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 that's the, the LaRouche people think that she runs that's it. it. That's right. I should know that because the LaRouche people hounded me for, for, for a couple of years. They were after me. So I, I should know. But yes, the Queen of England, she 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 runs everything. She it's all run from her. So um, yeah, you know, and it, there are lots of them and they come up all the time. And then, of course, there are real conspiracies, like what we're seeing with, with, with the Catholic Church. And, you know, uh, uh, people do bad things and they do bad things in an organized way and, and they're real conspiracies. So, I, so, so you published an a, a essay recently, which surprised me a little bit because I never thought of Ayn Rand talking about conspiracy theories because he doesn't have an essay on it, but about Ayn Rand's view of conspiracy theories. So could you give us like a um, like an introduction to what that is and, and maybe describe the essay a little bit? Yeah, well, actually, let me just give you a little background about why I got into this topic. Yep. Um, I'm I got interested in it because of my 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 background in philosophy and um, and in particular in epistemology. Uh, and I it started actually I was teaching a logic class in grad school It was right after 9-11. And I was starting to hear all these 9-11 truther conspiracy theories. And I wanted to have a nice case study that I could work with in my class of really sloppy reasoning. And I, I dug into some of these 9-11 conspiracy theories and, and I, I worked up a nice case study that I could Good. have the students analyze. Um, we could talk about that later if you're interested. Yeah, I yeah, know it's, it's uh, an interesting one because I've, I've actually gone up against some of these, uh, some of these 9-11 so-called truthers. So I, I actually really dug into it and I looked at all their arguments and I started to see patterns and, you know, they're, they're really good examples of, uh, in many cases of what Ayn Rand calls the arbitrary of uh, you know, speculating about possible explanations for things without any ground in the evidence where your imagination is really what's running things. Uh, and, in, the, in this case, at least, you know, your fear. Uh, so I became interested in them as examples of arbitrary reasoning. And, uh, I, and when I started work then at the Institute, I wanted to see, well, how can I use my, my interest in epistemology to write articles that, are, uh, that have cultural currency to them and apply to the controversies we're dealing with every day? And, uh, lo and behold, the, all this kind of conspiracy rhetoric starts to pop up everywhere just in the last few years, especially uh, with uh, with Trump. And I mean, it's not just Alex Jones. He's a conduit of it that's particularly vocal and there's been controversies about him. But but our president uh, regularly engages in a lot of this kind of rhetoric and a lot of his critics do, or sorry a lot of his fans do but it's critics too because there's i mean there's conspiracy theories about trump all the, the on the left and so it's it's on the left it's on the right it's everywhere and uh what and so i started to dig deeper into i'm just doing keyword searches on ayn rand's works to see where she commented on this it's something i'd noticed before that she was dismissive of them but i hadn't really looked closely to see what kind of common themes there were in her commentary on these issues. Yeah. And she's not somebody who so much spends time dissecting arguments of conspiracy theorists, uh, which uh, for I think a number of good, for a number of good reasons, I think I mean, it's not sort of not worth spending time on because so many of them are so absurd. But uh, what she does do is when she's 
when she's looking at various uh, political and cultural controversies, she's trying to explain why things got to be uh, the way they are, why there's some kind of irrational, destructive policy uh, that's that people are doubling down on in spite of the fact that they ought to know that it's irrational and destructive. And she's trying to explain it by reference to the ideas that the major players accept openly. Yep. Uh, and when she does this, she often comments on how, well, everybody on every side of this issue holds these major philosophical ideas. For example, the morality of altruism. And so when you have both people both sides of the issue basically agreeing on the basics and they only haggle over the particulars of how the policy is to be implemented. Some people might look at these kinds of examples and start to think there's a, some malevolent dark yep. power behind the scenes that's manipulating everything uh, to make this happen. And on a number of these different kinds of issues, she, she says it's not a conspiracy and you've got to look to the the basic premises that people accept in the open, that, that even the, the people who worry about conspiracies accept, uh, people who can't quite, uh, un, who don't understand what it means to take ideas seriously, and they don't understand that people actually believe these ideas and actually act on them. Uh, and so, I mean, the, ba the, the, biggest, the biggest issue is that she thinks the, the major decisions in history, the major decisions that move the world, are are ones that are in effect out in the open. Now there 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 is stuff that happens, you know, in the back in the back yeah, room. So, so before we get to that, let's just get let's just I, I want to dig a little deeper on what this out in the open means. Sure. I mean, what makes Rand unique, I think, among among intellectuals certainly today, is the idea that she believes that history is moved by ideas, and that those ideas are not um, hidden ideas, that but they're ideas that almost everybody accepts. And that when you analyze the events of the day, you analyze uh, you know, why people did what they did in 9-11, why the, we responded the way we did to 9-11, let's say, all of that, it, it, there's no hidden agenda here. There's no some secret cabal that, you know, Bin Laden told us why he did it. And Bush was motivated by something when he did what he did. And it turns out that he's motivated by altruism, just like, just like the pacifists are motivated by altruism. Yeah, at the end of the day, there's not that big of a difference between them. And that, that it's the ideas are in the open and that the ideas move history and ideas move important events in the world. There's no, there's nothing else. Yeah, I mean, 9-11 is a good example to discuss that, I mean, she obviously didn't comment on this, but yeah. since our, you know, yeah. your listeners are probably more familiar with it, you know, the essence of the various theories about the, the truth review is that uh, our government uh, either planned and actually executed these terrorist attacks, or at the very least, they say they knew that it was going to happen and they kind of let it happen. And yep. the reason that they did this was because they they wanted to use it as a pretext to go to war in Iraq for oil or something like that, or Halliburton wanted to get defense contracts or what have you. Uh, and it's so it's imputing these uh, these motives of secret greed and they're they're they're, they're launching a multi-billion dollar war just so they can line their pockets with a few million but you know as i'm sure you've you're aware and you've commented on many times in the past uh the reasons why this happened are are far more transparent i mean as you say uh both sides of our political party and especially in our foreign policy there's 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 a long time uh, commitment to the idea that the United States' interests are not the most important ones, that we need to be deferential to other countries, that we can't be uh, we can't have an aggressive foreign policy and and there's there's you know decades of appeasement that have, have contributed to this uh, the buildup of this threat. And then it even gets down to the you know the very detailed level where you have you know the the various 9/11 hijackers in this country doing, you know, training on airplanes, but nobody wants to. Nobody wants to ask any questions about that because you know these are foreigners, and we don't want to be discriminatory. We don't want to upset Muslims. You know, we don't. Right. Want to, we don't want to tag them as Muslims. Right. Uh, and I mean, there are probably a lot of other things. And I don't think everything about the way that the uh, 
the attacks went down was simply because of altruism. A, a lot of it's just plain old, good old fashioned incompetence on, on, on the yeah. part of the government. But that's also uh, that's that's long standing issue uh, and w exactly what you would expect when it's not focusing on the task of uh, of national defense in the way that it should be because it's busy focusing on, on a million other uh, you know al altruistic uh, welfare policies or whatever what, what have you. Yeah, and and of course, and of course, the you know some people couldn't understand the how can people be so evil? How can people be so uh, you know how how could they you know the the government could be that evil? The U.S. government could be that evil, but but foreigners can't be that evil. Muslims can't be that evil. Uh, individuals can't be that evil. They they attribute all the evil to the the powers to be the the conspirators. And of course, no. I mean, if you study what Bin Laden says and what he believes and what he thinks and what he's done. And how he behaves, yeah, no, he's exactly that evil. And there's no surprise here. And he, and he tells you exactly what his motivation. I mean, there were even people who thought part of the conspiracies were uh, that the CIA paid him, right, to do it. So it, it even got to that point because people couldn't, well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people go to the conspiracy theories. Maybe we can talk about that towards the end. Fear is definitely part of that. But, it, but I think it's deeper than, than fear. Um, but I, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're not trained in our culture to think of ideas as guiding decisions and ideas as shaping history. That's not taught. That, that's not. So people look at the events of the world and they are bewildered. You know, it's, it's, it, it, particularly if they share, as you said, the values of the people engaged in what they're doing. But they did the right things. How, how could this happen? And definitely a common theme is that in Rand's commentary is that there's, I mean, she has some sensitivity to why people would, yeah. would believe in conspiracy, in these conspiracies, because she understands that, yeah, the world is bewildering. And you, you sort of have, to, if you don't know how to use philosophy to understand the ideas that move the world, you, this is sometimes the best that you've got left. Uh, because it's hard to understand the, the motivation behind evil. It's hard to understand that some people just want to destroy things for the sake of destroying things, that they don't have any kind of actual self-interested motive, uh, that they just hate people, or that they're trying to convince themselves that they're good, even though, that they're, even though they're not. There's a whole uh, uh, issue here of uh, the role of irrational philosophy in rationalizing base motives. Um, and there's a whole issue here also about one's view of evil. Yeah. Uh, not just that people misunderstand what evil is, but that they have the view that evil is powerful. And, and this intersects with a lot in her philosophy because, of course, oh. she famously argued that evil is impotent uh, and thrives only to the extent that it gains uh, the sanction of the good. Now, how does this connect to the issue of conspiracy theories? Well, because the people who believe in these conspiracies, they believe that evil is powerful. Yep. They, they think that, that some kind of dark forces behind the scenes actually have the power to pull the strings that move the world. Uh, and Rand's view is that they don't. Um, and I mean, there are conspiracies. There are people who do things uh, secretly and furtively behind closed oh, doors. 9-11 is a good example. Bin Laden exactly. was a conspiracy, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but... I mean, the, the language that she always uses to describe them is they're, they're cockroaches, they're parasites, they're termites, they're insignificant little yeah. creatures who, because of the philosophical concessions that good people give to them, are able to hide uh, and, and rationalize what they're doing they, under the cover of this philosophy that we ourselves agree with. Yeah. And if we didn't give them that, if we didn't give them that cover, both intellectually and sometimes materially, uh, they wouldn't have the power that they that they have, and they wouldn't be able to get away with the things that they do. So take Bin Laden just as an example of that, right? He became prominent because the CIA funded him in Afghanistan. That's not a conspiracy theory; that's just fact. Yeah, yeah. And then when he turned his guns to them to to the United States, we ignored him. We lobbed missiles into deserts. We did everything we could, just not to not to actually kill him and not to actually destroy him when we knew. He was planning attacks in the United States. We emboldened him uh, with our statements and our examples of weakness. He often quotes, you know, the U.S. you know tail between the legs, running from Somalia, or Beirut, or whatever. 
So it's our weakness, it's our altruism, it's our unwillingness to confront him that emboldened him, that gave him the power, and then ultimately, ultimately allowed him to, to succeed. So even so, so we can take any case of, of modern evil at that, you know, at the political le- uh, scale, it is emboldened and made possible by, uh, you know, the fault of the good. And something I think that's really interesting is that this is a this is a identification that she made, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, where the the major evil that she was analyzing was the spread of communism yep. throughout the world, and the communists were far more powerful than the the Islamists are, and yep. far yep. more dangerous and far more threatening. I mean, they had oh, conspiratorial, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but even still, she was able, and even though she was herself a refugee from communism she still was able to see these people wouldn't be able to pose the threat that they pose if it weren't for the concessions the West uh, and intellectuals more broadly are giving them. And so if it's true about the communists, certainly true of the, the Islamist threat. That we and that was the main conspiracy she, she was dealing with at that time is that the, right. the communists, they, you know, in, in, in infiltrating the U.S. government and they, they're causing all this stuff and, and uh, this is why the state is growing or whatever. Um, so what was the, what was the retort to that? To the, to the idea that the communists were the, were the real force behind American politics? Well, I mean, she did think that there were some. And you know, this is part of the reason why she was involved <laughs> in the, the, uh, the Army McCarthy hearings, uh, testified before HUAC. Uh, and so she, and she thought that they were there and she thought that they should be investigated. And, they, and people who were you know, actual members of the Communist Party of the United States, which was dedicated to overthrowing the government, they should be... I mean, they were criminals. Uh, but it, at the same time, she thought that there wasn't that much they were able to get away with, uh, uh, you know, unless it was because we were, we were sanctioning them and uh, giving them power. And the, the passage that I quote in the article, uh, which is from one of her very early nonfiction pieces from, for the new intellectual, really says it all. Uh, she says, if America perishes, it will perish by intellectual default. There's no diabolical conspiracy to destroy it. No conspiracy could be big enough and strong enough. Such cafeteria socialist conspiracies as do undoubtedly exist are groups of scared, neurotic mediocrities who find themselves pushed into national leadership because nobody else steps forward. They're pickpockets who merely intended to snatch a welfare regulation or two and who suddenly find their victim is unconscious, that they are alone in an enormous mansion of fabulous wealth. With all the doors open, a seasoned burglar's job on their hands. Watch them now screaming that they didn't mean it, uh, that they didn't, that they never intended the nationalization of the country's economy. As to the communist conspirators in the service of Soviet Russia, they're the best illustration of victory by default. Their successes are handed to them by the concession of their victims. Yeah, and she's very critical of conservatives because she, she, she identifies conservatives as sharing the moral premise of the communists and therefore the conservatives not being able to stand up to the, the welfare statists, to the efforts to ultimately lead to socialism in America. And, and of course, we're seeing that in spades today. Yeah, I and you the final sentence of that quote, um, history, fate, and malevolent conspiracy are easier to believe, this is about the motivation, right? Than the actual truth that we are moved by nothing but the sluggish inertia of unfocused minds. Right. And the unfocused minds here are the conservatives, the, 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 the Americans, the people who are, you know, who are letting this happen. Uh, it's not the communists, right? It, it, the communists are cockroaches. They're not even on focused minds. The, it's, it's the default of, of the people just accepting this and, and going with the flow that she's really upset about. Yeah, and you see this, for example, in, the, in the, her analysis of the, of the antitrust issue, which is one of the first examples I yep, discussed. Yep. You know, she says there are conservatives who will uh, hem and haw and get on their high horse about uh, tax rate changes and uh, you know, tiny little middling uh, regulations. But when it comes to the antitrust laws, which openly penalize businessmen for being successful and, and are, in her view, drawing us closer to a kind of dictatorship where there's no rule of law and arbitrary decisions uh, farmed out to bu- you know, nameless bureaucrats, they have nothing to say about that. Yeah. And they're as on board as they ever could be. And <laughs> you see that today. Uh, in in the antitrust rhetoric that is now coming mostly from 
the right, mostly from conservatives. The left is jumping on the bandwagon very quickly about it, uh, but everybody agrees. And uh, you know, the, the tech uh, the tech companies are now the, the the new target, who are you know the the most successful and inspiring. Uh, industrialists of the last 30 years, we, uh, they want to. Or maybe the last more than 30 years even. But, but more than that, I would say what's really ugly about these attacks is that there's a, there's a, there's a, a attack on free speech at the, cu coupled with it. That is, yeah. the motivation for the antitrust is issues related to speech, which yes. makes it so much more. I mean, economic justifications are evil enough, but then if on top of the economic justification, you're making these attempts to manipulate what private entities do with their own content that just takes it to a next level yeah this is actually the next piece i'm working on uh, <coughs> oh good looking at the uh at, at ayn rand's own commentary on this very same issue in the early 60s with the kennedy administration where the same yeah. thing was happening and they were using antitrust law to justify uh restrictions on broadcasters it's uh, startling to me how much she hated how much she she thought kennedy was bad and <laughs>